Greetings, this is Dr. Seth Ward. This is a recording of a lecture that I gave on November 10th, 2019 for the Jewish War Veterans in Denver, Colorado. I am recording the lecture a few days after I gave it. The title was Israel and the Middle East 25 years after the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. I like to begin these lectures with a little bit about myself. You can see on your screen some of the courses I teach at the University of Wyoming, as some of the lectures I've given for the Wyoming Humanities Council and other uh, um, organizations. I also have given expert testimony on religious civil rights, Jewish and Islamic law, uh, mostly relating prisoners in both state and federal institutions. On the left, you'll see two pictures of groups I take to the State of Israel and to the Kingdom of Jordan most summers um, since 2009. I teach Islamic and Jewish studies at the University of Wyoming and modern Middle East. And I've been doing that since 2003. Before that, I taught at the University of Denver and the University of Haifa. Some of the upcoming events and projects that I'm currently involved in are listed on your current screen. When I gave this talk, Raisins and Almonds, uh, January 26, 2020, was in the future. It's honoring Ozzy and Selma Sladek. The talk was given at Sinai, uh, Temple Sinai in Denver, where uh, the Sladeks have been members. Part of the reason I do this is because my ability to give these talks is made possible by the University of Wyoming's generosity in employing me and by the University of Wyoming Israel Studies Excellence Fund. Yitzhak Rabin was born in 1922 and died in 1995, the victim of an assassination. He was a hero of the Palmach and the Israel War of Independence. He was chief of, chief of staff in 1963 in Israel and was one of the uh, leaders in the Six Day War. He served as the ambassador of the United States he was prime minister for two different terms, 73 to 77, and 1993 until 1995. He was the prototypical career military man who entered politics. He was known for the iron fist, uh, that is having a strong arm policy against uh, what today we call Palestinian Arabs, but also for saying, we don't make peace with our friends, we make peace with our enemies. He was the archetypical member of the um, Eastern European heritage, Jewish, very secular establishment that was responsible for much of the early her uh, history of the state of Israel. And in fact, Dennis Ross, active in American foreign policy for the Middle East for many uh, years, uh, Ross described Rabbi as the most secular Jew he had met. Rabin's parents came from Eastern Europe. They met in Jerusalem during the Nebi Musa riots of 1920. Nebi Musa was a festival that used to be run by the Husseini family at or about at the time of the Greek Easter celebrations. They would go down from Jerusalem to the Nebi Musa location, which is on the road down to Jericho, actually just about even with Jericho. <laughs> Today, you can see it from the highway, a little south of the highway, uh, very much at the bottom of the plain of the Jordan River. This was an uprising that was a response to the, um, to the Jews in Jerusalem shortly after the time in which Trumpledor fell and fighting in what today is the north of uh, Israel at Tel Chai. He was born in Jerusalem, but his parents moved to Tel Aviv and sent him to agricultural schools where he started military training as a teenager. He joined the Palmach in 1941. He participated in a famous raid the Palmach was involved in, in which they attacked uh, positions of the Vichy French in Lebanon. He also was involved in the raid on the prisoner of war camp in Atlit, uh, where uh, there were Jewish uh, uh, Jews who attempted to make, do Ill Ill um, illegal immigration into Israel, uh, were also um, interned. 
He became the chief operations officer in 1947 and thus was well placed to participate in the War of Independence. In the Independence War, he was active in cutting the Burma War Road uh, to parallel the regular highway to supply Jerusalem and to ensure that Ramat Rachel stayed in Israeli territory. During the time of the first truce in 1948, he was Ben-Gurion's man to um, operate against Menachem Begin's uh, uh, supply ship, the Altalena, a very famous uh, event in internal Jewish community uh, 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 interactions at that time. It's important to note that documents that have come to life make it clear that he was involved in the expulsion of Arabs from Ramla and Lud. Um, this is one of the very, very controversial actions in terms of looking back on history, whether the Arabs in Ramla fled of their own accord or whether they were forced out. Uh, for many years, the traditional Zionist explanation had been that the Arabs left of their own accord. They were uh, urged by their um, leadership to abandon some of the towns. Uh, but it's become clear that in some locations, in point of fact, once they were captured, there was a push to expel Arabs from those cities. Ramla and Lud are very close to the airport. The, the airport that you uh, generally fly into in Tel Aviv is in, in Lud, and uh, there was considered to be a security consideration. Rabin was involved in that. Rabin was involved in fighting on the Southern Front and was present at the armistice negotiations that ended the independence. He didn't advance much in the IDF, but he eventually became the chief of staff under Levi Eshkol. Uh, in 1967, as chief of staff, he was a hero, you might say, the, the, the uh, military brains behind the 1967 victory of the Israeli forces. He retired from the military shortly thereafter, became ambassador to the United States, where he served with great distinction until 1970. Golda Meir resigned in 1974, shortly after the Yom Kippur War. Uh, she probably felt guilty that she was not able to uh, work harder. Uh, she was... Uh, uh, exonerated by the investigative committee that looked into it, and in fact won the next election, but resigned shortly thereafter. Uh, he beat Paris to become the party leader, and his first term as prime minister uh, went until 1977. Among the things which he did at that time was he signed the Sinai Interim Agreement to end the use of military force to resolve conflict in the region on September 1st. This was a very difficult set of negotiations. On your screen, you can say you can see what Gerald Ford uh, said in 1975 about the difficulty of negotiating with Israel and with um, Rabin as a prime minister. Rabin had worked with Kissinger since the time that he was the U.S. the ambassador to the United States, and in point of fact, this Sinai interim agreement was one of the stepping stones so very soon after the 1973 war, which eventually led to the negotiations in 78 and the signing of a peace treaty with Egypt in 1979. So although Begin should get the credit for the peace treaty with Egypt, uh, one can also give Rabin some of that credit, despite the fact that he was seen as a strong arm against the Arabs at that time. Uh, Rabin resigned as prime minister following a financial scandal where Leah Rabin, his wife, uh, uh, admitted to keeping uh, small accounts in the United States after their term as prime minister, which was illegal under Israeli law. There are differing versions of the amount of money that she retained in the United States. Some say it was under $2,000. Uh, some of the accounts say that it was far more substantial, ten to $20,000 that were kept. Uh, in any case, it was a, against Israeli law, and uh, they resigned. Menachem Begin won 
in 1977 uh, against the uh, uh, won the prime ministership at that time. And the Likud has more or less been in power with only brief uh, breaks since. Rabin returned to politics. He was Minister Def of Defense from 84 to 1990. Uh, he was involved, for example, in pulling back Israeli forces to a security zone in Lebanon. Uh, he implemented an iron fist policy in the uh, West Bank. Uh, he is famous for being called a bone breaker, using force, might, and beatings in the first intifada. But that policy really didn't succeed. And reports are that he was beginning to consider negotiations rather than force in 1987 with the Intifada. Things changed after the Gulf War and the Madrid Conference, and a secret back channel in which members of the Israeli uh, political science movement and some uh, government officials negotiated secretly in Oslo and Norway to uh, start what has usually been called the Oslo process. Now, there was some indication that the 78 Camp David protocols uh, were the background of that. And uh, in any case, the Israelis, for the first time, met directly with the PLO. Many people who will be seeing this video remember the handshake on September 13th in 1993, in which Yitzhak Rabin recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people, and Yasser Arafat uh, signed a document that said he recognized the state of Israel. Lest you think that he, uh, Rabin's only contributions were in the political process, uh, Rabin also, uh, although he came from a strong labor background, was involved in privatization, reformed education, a number of new colleges and a university were started at, uh, under his, uh, in his premiership. The Trans-Israel Highway, which is now called the Yitzhak Rabin Highway, although everybody calls it Route 6, um, was started under Rabin, and the expansion of Ben Gurion uh, Airport also occurred. Uh, Rabin also implemented a Gaza barrier in 1994 uh, that was highly effective at limiting uh, Gaza, uh, what we would call terrorist activities going across from the Gaza uh, border. At the time, Rabin said, we who have fought against you, the Palestinians, we say to you today in a loud and a clear voice, enough of blood and tears, enough. Rabin will probably remember, be remembered for this period, primarily for the Oslo Treatise and for his tough stance, yet his opening uh, for saying, we need to have negotiations. We don't need to have blood and tears. This was undoubtedly the reason why he was assassinated on November 4th, 1995. Uh, there had been a massive rally, a peace rally on Motzei Shabbat, the end of the Sabbath. Uh, people from all over Israel came. Uh, I recall hearing from some of my Palestinian Arab uh, colleagues that they sent demonstrators as well to go and support peace. Rabin is pictured here singing the Shir La Shalom, the song for peace uh, that had been an Israeli popular hit. A national religious advocate named Yigal Amir shot Rabin at the end of the uh, rally. The location is shown on your screen on the lower right hand side where he was shot. There had been in ultra in religious, national religious, but extremist national religious circles, there had been an awful lot of opposition to Rabin giving up Israeli land towards a Palestinian state and making peace with Arabs, and uh, even a controversial, uh, you might say, a Kabbalistic spell was cast against Rabin. He was pictured as a pursuer, as a rodef, uh, somebody who, according to Jewish law, could be stopped even by killing him. Uh, because of the threat to other human lives. 
Uh, Rabin was assassinated, as I said, on November 4th. Uh, the Hebrew day was the 12th of Marcheshvan. To review what happened between 1995 and 2019, I'm starting with a very brief review of the prime minister since then. Peres came into power immediately after Peres, uh, after Yitzhak Rabin was shot. Uh, he did not succeed in the um, elections of 1996 when Netanyahu came to power, and you might say his first term. Uh, part of the reason why Netanyahu was elected was that Paris was, you could say Paris was ineffective at preventing some of the Arab terror events that occurred in uh, late night in at that time during the lead up to the election. And uh, <clears throat> who knows? I wonder whether Rabin might have been able to prevent those things or respond to them in a more forceful way. Netanyahu served until 1999 when uh, Barak, representing the labor, uh, came back into power. Sharon was from the Likud, and so was Olmert, and then Net uh, Netanyahu came back to power in 2009. I'll talk about some of the major events of that time uh, in the next couple of <sighs> The first thing I'll mention is the Oslo process. Although we talk about the Oslo process failing uh, in 2000, which is point number two, uh, we also have to realize that the PLO was recognized as the basis of the Palestinian Authority, and the Palestinian Authority has autonomous rule in quite a few places. Uh, West Bank uh, or Yehuda and Shomron were divided into areas A, B, and C. Uh, in some areas, there's full Palestinian control. In some areas, there's full Jewish control. In some areas, there's a kind of joint agreement, uh, joint arrangement. And this is still in effect. Uh, some areas of the West Bank and um, uh, or Yehuda and Shomron have been set aside as nature reserves or as places that will never be developed. And that's still in, into effect. Uh, the Oslo process changed the way, in my humble opinion, changed the way that Israelis talked about Israel as a Jewish state, as well as Israel as a democratic state, in part because the Palestinian side accepted Israel, but did not accept Israel as the Jewish state. At least that's how people in Israel understood it. And the notion of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state or to use language from the Israeli Declaration of Independence, Israel is both the Jewish state and the state of its inhabitants. That discussion also started by Oslo is, is still with us. Number two, the Camp David talks in 2000 uh, led to the failure of Oslo. And about that time, there was also the second intifada. Mitchell Bard has argued that we should call this the Palestinian War of 2000 as a concentrated response to the failure of Oslo, uh, in which uh, Yasser Arafat organized something that looked like it was spontaneous, but in fact, according to at least some observers, was uh, organized top down by the PA itself. Camp David was a last ditch attempt, you might say, by President Clinton to work with Ehud Barak and with Yasser Arafat. The way that Clinton and Barak tell the story, um, they offered Arafat as much or more than anybody had ever offered him. Almost all of his demands were met, but Arafat would say that his key demands were not met and therefore uh, he, there was no deal. The third theme for the period, the past uh, 24 years, is hardened lines on both sides. Uh, Rabin, you might say, was assassinated because the hardening of the lines in some sectors of the national religious community. Uh, since then, you might say that inside Israel itself, uh, there's emerged what people typically call four tribes based on a speech that 
the president of the state of Israel, uh, Ruvi Rivlin, made on June 7, 2015. Uh, I couldn't find an English language version of the chart, but it says um, welcoming the new Israel order or something like that, and shows that on the right-hand side in uh, elementary education in 1990, over half were in the um, national schools. 23% that's, uh, were Arab, 9% were ultra-Orthodox, 16% were national religious. In 2018, in uh, first grade, national religious is about the same, 15%. The Arab sector is a little bit larger, 25%. The ultra-Orthodox sector, Haredi, is 22%. And the national sector is 38%. The point of this chart is to suggest that the Arab and ultra Orthodox sector together are 47% of school children, gone up from uh, 31%, and that that growth represents a tremendous growth in the sectors of the tribes of Israel who are not highly committed to. Israel, not as a democratic state and not as a Jewish state. At least that's how the argument goes. In some ways, the hardened lines are found on the Palestinian Arab side as well. The PLO and Hamas have been frozen in some ways since the legislative elections in 2006, and neither the president nor the legislature have had elections in over a decade. Uh, even in Fatah, which is a very, very secular organization, there's increasingly religious rhetoric and lines have been uh, drawn in the, uh, in the, the argument. Uh, speaking today when I'm recording this, among other things, although I believe that the Israel-Jordan peace treaty, which I'll talk about in a few moments, is very strong, I also think that the withdrawal of Jordanian support for two enclaves, one near Naharaim in the north, one near uh, one in the south in the Arava Valley, uh, withdrawal of their support for those two enclaves, very small enclaves, is also part of the hardened lines. I think the symbolism of agreeing to have full Jordanian sovereignty and allowing Israel to lease the lands I think was a very strong indicator of peace, and the island near Naharayim was called the Peace Island. Uh, and I look at this as unfortunate, hard, an unfortunate hardening of the. The fourth theme I'd like to talk about is Israeli prosperity and happiness. Rabin, our subject today, may well have started or encouraged privatization and other major reforms, although Netanyahu has to give an awful lot of credit for uh, be, has to be given an awful lot of credit, and so does Paris. Uh, Paris served as a prime minister in the 1980s. He got the triple digit inflation under control. And by the end of the 1980s, uh, Israeli economy had begun to boom and become come to a, resemble a first world economy in very strong ways. In any case, Israel became a member of the OECD in 2010. And in things like the Human Development Index chart, uh, it's listed in the top 20 or so industrialized economies. The uh, chart that I have shows the growth in gross domestic capita per uh, purchasing power parity in uh, billions of dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, the overall GDP in billions of US dollars PPP and the per capita, uh, per capita GDP in US PPP. And again, this means if that this these numbers make it very much a first world country. Uh, alongside Israelis always score high on happiness and many other of these things score reasonably high on democracy and so on. Again, in line with the development. Fifth thing to mention in the past 24 years, settlement boom. In 1993, in the West Bank, excluding Jerusalem and in East Jerusalem, there were 300,000, uh, three, maybe 360,000 uh, settlers. There were still some in the Gaza Strip. 
Uh, I'm trying to get the numbers organized. I could not get a real accurate interpretation of what was East Jerusalem uh, as it's understood in these charts in 2019. Um, I did get a number for the West Bank, 448,672. However, you make these up by 2014 or today in 2019, there are somewhere between 800,000 to a million, um, we'll call them Jewish residents or Israeli Jewish residents who are in areas of East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights and the West Bank. This is significantly up from the time of uh, Rabin and represent a very important feature of Israeli life. Uh, most of these settlements are in blocks that are very, either in, inside East Jerusalem or areas of Jerusalem that are over the Green Line uh, or adjacent or very close to East Jerusalem or in a small number of blocks, including places such as Gush Etzion, where there were Jewish residents prior to 1948, uh, where the settles, the uh, the communities, the region was abandoned by Jews, basically because it was attacked and the all the, um, survive, the all the Jewish residents who were left in the area were murdered on the day of the day before the declaration of the state. Part of the reason why that is Israel's Memorial Day. And then there are areas in which there had uh, been ancient Jewish residents and areas that were completely new. There are Israeli attempts to remove Jewish settlers as well as Palestinian settlers. This is a very complicated issue today, one that I don't have time to talk about more than to mention that there is, uh, again, one of the fifth theme of the past 24 years that I'm talking about is a boom in the settlements and the issues. The sixth theme that I want to mention is disengagements and barriers. Earlier, I mentioned the barrier against Gaza, which was very effective. And in 2002, uh, as a response to the second intifada or the Palestine war, as it was called by Mitchell Bard, the barrier was begun. In that year, there were 457 Israelis killed by what I would say the kinds of terror that the barrier was supposed to prevent in 2018, uh, sorry for the typo on your screen, only 14 uh, Israelis were killed. The barrier has been seen as being tremendously effective. It was built together with a rise in human intelligence and also with an attempt to monitor uh, Yasser Arafat and to um, prevent him from, um, basically to isolate him uh, from being able to carry out these activities. <coughs> if the barriers worked, the disengagements did not, or are seen as not uh, working. In 2000, Israeli troops left Southern Lebanon, and 2005, their uh, support for Jewish residents in Gaza and Northern Shomron, uh, the areas of the Northern West Bank, um, were that support was withdrawn and Israeli residents were removed from those locations. The military stopped having an active presence in those areas. The Israeli military stopped having an active presence in those areas. Most Israelis would say that these withdrawals were justified, but there was no peace dividend from the unilateral action of withdrawing from those locations. Within six years, uh, Hezbollah began abducting Israeli soldiers. Push came to shove. The Israelis retaliated or initiated a, a very severe bombing campaign in southern Lebanon. There's been peace and quiet since, you might say. Um, but Hezbollah has been growing in strength. And in Gaza, there have been multiple uh, attempts by the Gaza, by uh, either Hamas, which controls Gaza since 2006, or by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, seen by most people as an arm of Iran, um, and who, as I speak now, whose leader was recently uh, targeted and assassinated by the Israeli Defense Forces. Seventh theme is that the military actions of the 
post-Rabin era are not at all like the actions of the pre-state era and the time of 1948 to sometime in the 1980s. The Al-Aqsa Intifada, the Lebanon War, the operations in Gaza, even the operations against the Friday demonstrations earlier this year were not like the all outdrawn state to state conflicts of uh, since May of 1948 in the independence war, in the six day war, in the, ba in the war of attrition, in the Yom Kippur war, in the Lebanon, uh, first Lebanon war in 1982, which involved state actors, massive uh, troop movements and so on. All of these worked very, very differently than those previous ones had. In uh, 2000, in the late 1900s, and especially in 2000s, the in, um, buildup has been in military groups such as Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, Iranian support has come to dwarf, in my humble opinion, the role of the Muslim Brotherhood secular and even al-Qaeda type of organizations in terms of um, targeting Israeli sources, uh, Israeli, um, uh, targeting Israel and Israeli. The next point uh, is to enlarge even more broadly on the idea of Iran and its proxies and on Islam Islamist parties projecting power. The Middle East some decades ago had secular republics, modern king, moderate kingdoms, Islamic Iran since 1979, and Turkey allied with Israel. 1979, I think, is a key year, 40 years ago, changing everything. You had the Iranian Revolution in February. Uh, at first, it looks like there looked like there were some liberal uh, or at least non-Islamist parties that were involved. By November, the Islamist parties had won out. 1979 was the year of the Egypt-Israel peace agreement. It was the year in which Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath party, but Saddam, the Ba'ath party had, um, had come to power in Iraq. Saddam Hussein openly came to control all of Iraq. There was a revolt in the Saudi mosque and the ramifications of the attack on the mosque by a Saudi group um, led to changes in uh, the Saudi government governance, and in fact encouraged a then little known fighter, Osama bin Laden, a uh, son of an important engineer who had been working in the area of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, uh, encouraged him to get involved in responding to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, he eventually came to create the Mujahideen uh, the uh, jihadi fighters, and the, eventually al-Qaeda. Iran fought Iraq for in the 1980s, and in the 1990s, after the Iran-Iraq war settled, you had the invasion of Iraq, uh, uh, by Iraq of uh, Kuwait. Uh, you also had the rise of political Islam in the Gulf, and you had the Iranian nuclear program coming to the fore. Rabin apparently had learned about it in 1992 and tried to warn the Clinton administration. The CIA did not accept that the program in Iran was military and oriented towards weapons of mass destruction, towards nuclear missiles, until, the, um, until 1998. Iran and Iraq... The Ba'ath secular party, uh, mostly Shia, uh, Sunni Muslims, but secular Iran, the religious uh, Islamist uh, Shia country. The balance of power in that part of the Middle East was upset by the U.S. invasion of Iraq and uh, whatever weaknesses Iraq had after that time. Uh, the so-called Arab Spring after 2011 also focused the arguments and you might say the leadership of the Sunni world went over to the Saudi monarchy, uh, the leadership of the Shia world in Iran. And in 2015, there was the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, the so-called nuclear deal. 
Uh, this was a time in which you had the rise of the Islamic State, whose flag is portrayed there on the on the slide, and the and the uh, rise of the Iranian Republic, the, the Islamic Republic, of projecting its power in the Middle East in Arabic-speaking areas, uh, changing the balance of power of, of regional entities in the Middle East. I left this slide more or less blank, not that Trump has no Israel policy, but the policy of the current president of the United States is also a theme to think about in the last 24 years since his election in 2016 and his taking office in 2017. Trump has had openings up to the Saudis. He has had a interesting and complicated relationship with the Turks, uh, I think supporting them too much. Uh, he has continued and in fact exacerbated the process of giving Russians more input in the Middle East. I don't trust Mr. Putin to do the right thing by the Middle East. He has also uh, recognized the, the city of Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel, moved the embassy there. Uh, some people thought that all hell would break loose. That certainly has not happened. Uh, we'll see whether in the long run, long term this turns out to be a, um, uh, we'll see what the ramifications are in American policy and in the Middle East since then. Uh, I think the most important thing about Mr. Trump, though, is that uh, his policy in the Middle East has been viewed by many people as uh, being, uh, having many swings and being implemented quickly, implemented before having some sort of rational and uh, deliberate debate with military advisors, with State Department advisors, uh, committed to, without commitment to a long-term policy and so on. And this uh, fluctuating and often unclear policy uh, may turn out to, it may turn out to have benefits, but it's also likely to have detriments. I think his uh, policy, from speaking what I'm doing now in November of, of 2019, I think his policy regarding the Kurds um, is uh, seen as abandonment of an ally and as not promoting uh, security and stabilization in the region. And I just, I just can't understand, uh, I, I can't see any benefit in it. Arab world changes. I have on the a slide the 10th and final theme of the past 24 years that I want to discuss. Al-Qaeda was active even before 2001. It declared war against the United States in one or two very famous fatwas in the 1990s. I mentioned the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the Arab Spring 2011, the declaration of the caliphate by the um, self-declared Islamic State. The Kurdish plebiscite in 2017, given the roles of the Kurds in fighting Islamic State, again, I'm speaking in 2019, it's important to mention that the Kurds have gone on record as wanting an independent state in Kurdistan. There was a brief Kurdish state in Mahabad uh, just after World War II, uh, two, uh, 1946. There are a large number of Kurds in Northern Iraq in uh, eastern Syria, in southern Turkey, uh, southwestern, southeastern Turkey, near Iraq and Syria, and in Iran, uh, they do not have an independent state. They had a functioning uh, autonomous region in Kurdistan and Iraq. Uh, one of the ramifications of the plebiscite in 2017 is that there was some pushback against Kurdish autonomy uh, in that area. There were riots in Iran in 2009 against the, uh, at the time of the elections at that time in, in Iran. And today, as I speak, there are, are demonstrations in Lebanon and Iraq in 2019. And in 2019, we also have um, all sorts of changes going on slow or slowly or quickly in parts of the world, uh, the Arab world. 
change a here's what I wrote a changing interaction between concepts of family tribe region religious national community and nation the discourse about how the Arab world will link all of those various concepts is a very lively one in many, many parts of the region. Looking ahead, two-state solution. I think the slogan has outlived its usefulness. Even for those who believe that there should be a Palestinian state along a Jewish-Israeli state. The slogan may survive. I don't think it should. Um, recently in Denver, Colorado, there was a um, Arab visitor na named Taufik Hamid who's talked about a two-stage solution in which the first stage is changing Arab minds about uh, the state of Israel and the Jewish religion to remove the demonization and the antagonism and the anti-Semitism. I don't know that his two-stage solution will replace the uh, this slogan, but I do think we need a new slogan. Number two, the Palestinian Authority has been proven to be corrupt. Israelis don't see it as transforming Palestinian ideas about a Palestinian Arab state, in part of historic, what the Arabs would call historic Palestine. Back when the PA was being formed, and for quite a few years after that, there was a kind of Zionist discourse that assumed that just as the creation of an Israeli state had transformed the Jewish people and normalized their existence, so too the creation of an Arab state in Palestine would transform Palestinians, would lead to a better life for them, would lead to normalizing their approach and so on. Uh, I don't think people see that this is the actual, P the actual goal of the PA. Uh, and until they change that, again, we can talk about uh, Tawfiq Hamid's idea. Until they change that idea and they are interested in a better life for Palestinians, for human rights, for fighting corruption in the authority, um, until they're interested in transforming Palestinian lives rather than defeating the Israelis, and Israelis would, I think, justifiably think that many among them removing the Israeli state, until they as, uh, until they have that other approach, I don't think the Israeli left and the peace camp will overcome their strategic weakness in the Israeli society. Peace with Jordan and with Egypt. Uh, I don't see any reason to assume that this peace will get warmer and have better relations, but the peace itself will be strong in things like security cooperation, intergovernmental uh, uh, interactions for security issues and for issues that are uh, crucial to the peace agreement will continue. Number four, um, as I mentioned earlier, the great divide in Israeli society has only increased from the time of Rabin. This is not only due to differences over the land of Israel idea that were visible and played a role in assassinating Rabin, but in the wide world, the great divide between the left and the right is also increasing in many countries, in the United States and many European countries and so on. And I do not think it will be easier to bridge in Israel <clears throat> than it is, has been anywhere else. I could be proven wrong by national unity governments uh, or a national unity government emerging in the next couple of days and changing things. and late 2020, uh, 2019 and early 2020, but that, that's what I think. External, number five, external realities in the region seem to be more important now toward driving war and peace in the region than ever before. Many of us are used to the idea of crisis in the Middle East referring to Israel and its Arab neighbors. I don't think that was ever true, but today it's more and more obvious that the Middle East crisis is not with respect to Israel and its neighbors. The, at least the political borders with Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, and Jordan have been, let's say, peaceful in the sense that <clears throat> the government actors and even the main terrorist groups have 
rarely use those borders for cross-border activities. And in fact, the areas of the Islamic State, areas in the Gulf, issues uh, having to do with uh, rallies for promoting democracy and so on, are, are now seen in, as more important aspects of defining peace in the Middle East. I think the idea of looking at Israel versus its Arab neighbors as being the key to peace in the Middle East region is one that was promoted uh, by the Israelis to some extent and by the Arab League and similar organizations to a great extent. And I think that always was a misrepresentation. Israel's, the, the situation that Israel was in was in part a reflection of problems elsewhere in the Middle East as much or more than it was the cause of those problems by, uh, in, uh, in my belief. Number six. Um, I'm going to do number seven first. Israel will form a government without new elections. I said this a week ago today, and I still believe that will be the case. The prime minister will be named Benjamin. Still not clear whether Benjamin Netanyahu or Benjamin Gantz. I think Netanyahu will be indicted. I think he will avoid jail. Uh, I think that Israel will continue to do things that might create war, but stop short of warranting all-out war. This was, uh, I think, um, I certainly wrote this line before the uh, leader of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad was assassinated. And I think that there was this idea, there'll be items that will not lead to a large war, but they will continue to push back against Iran on all fronts. Uh, number seven, displayed by a programming error on my, uh, displayed before number six because of a programming error on my part. Uh, on the other hand, uh, six, eight, nine, and ten are broader than simply the Israeli uh, scheme. Iran, uh, Iranian nuclear aspirations. I think Iran will continue to be a new nuclear state. I think it will, near nuclear state, I think it will get closer to nuclear weapon capacity. I don't think any internal or external considerations will stop them. I think the Islamic State will eventually moderate or fall, but this will be over many, many decades, not in the near future. In the short term, I think that's part of Iranian projection of power. They don't need to have a bomb. They only need to have people believe that they are very close to having one. That will do as much as is necessary to project power in the Middle East, to a certain extent, Saddam Hussein, with weapons of mass destruction, where his enemies believed that he had them, even though <clears throat> the examiners could not find them. And to a certain extent, Israeli, um, uh, the Israeli nuclear program as well is the same kind of thing. Israel has tremendous deterrence because everybody believes or say that, say, everyone says that they know that Israel has nuclear bombs, despite the fact that Israel has never tested them. Number eight, Turkey, Kurds, and Armenians. Uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, he will very unfortunately, I believe, survive and thrive, at least in the near term, with the help of uh, Putin and Trump. I don't think the U.S. will pay as much attention as it should to the failure of his economic program, to his anti-democratic measures, to his uh, uh, efforts in uh, Syria and so on. And again, I think that Erdogan will be, uh, will, will not have any pressure from the international world. Kurdish aspirations will continue to be compromised. I do see the possibility of strong autonomy in various areas, a non-recognized state, and I see that as the only way to a Kurdish state. I don't see it as a large possibility. But in point of fact, the Kurds could declare independence like the Albanians did in uh, Kosovo and some other locations and perhaps be recognized as an independent state. I don't think it's very likely. I think that in, in the long term, the Kurds, um, despite the fact that they are one of the largest communities that 
is a nation, sees itself as a nation, has contiguous areas in which they live, and does not have a state. I don't think that they will get one in the near term. In terms of the Armenians, uh, there was recently a U.S. Congress uh, declaration rec recognizing Armenian genocide. Uh, I have this kind of hope that news reports that Kim Kardashian uh, was going to become the symbol behind recognizing Armenian genocide uh, in memory of her father. Uh, I just don't, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see if there's a memorial on April 24th led by Kim Kardashian and attended by Trump, which makes a big American commitment to this idea. Demonstrations in Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, speaking in November of 2019, uh, these have been on the news for several weeks now. Uh, in Lebanon, Prime Minister Hariri has resigned. I don't think there's a new government uh, anywhere near being formed in Iraq. Uh, there was a report that the prime minister was ready to resign and offered his resignation and that he was, in fact, asked to do so by the president of Iraq, who is a Kurd. My feeling is that Lebanese demonstrations may herald a change in the popular perception of what Lebanon is all about in terms of creating a Lebanese identity which transcends the religious communities which are um, represented so very strongly in the government makeup, uh, possibly even leading to constitutional change. Uh, I don't think it's likely, but I think it's possible. Uh, Iraq, I see this as being less likely, although there could be a constitutional change. I think that uh, the Iraqi uh, um, statements are more about getting rid of corruption and of getting rid of the Iranian influence and insisting that the government of Iraq serve Iraqis rather than the needs of outside uh, operators. Change is afoot in the Gulf states. I don't think the Gulf states are about to recognize Israel. On the other hand, I do think that we are looking at the possibility of more informal interactions, modernization and economic diversification internally in the Gulf states. This is Saudi Arabia and the small states along the Gulf. I think that they will continue to have uh, regimes with absolute power. I do not think that there will be real democratization in these areas. I do think that Despite the fact that there will not be recognition, open recognition of Israel with the exchange of ambassadors, there will be more, I will say, informal exchange with Israel. Israelis will continue to be allowed to come visit those countries. Members of those countries will possibly have more ability to visit Israel. And this is an area that I think is ripe for uh, more action. I think there are Jordanians and Egyptians who would like to be able to visit the state of Israel, both in terms of Israeli welcome and in terms of the openness of their societies to have that kind of tourism. Uh, but the nature of societies on both ends, both the Israeli side and the um, Arab side, is, I, I think still makes this a very limited uh, role. I think it's important though for I just gave you 10 items, which I think are of importance. In the Middle East, if you guess wrong about the future, everyone dismisses it as normal. And if something you project actually happens, people praise your wisdom. So one could say that there is no downside to making predictions. I am sure, we can be sure, that nobody will act or accurately predict what will come. The Talmud said long ago that prophecy was taken away from prophets and given over to fools and little children. I hope I'm not a fool and that it's been a long time since I've been a little child. Nevertheless, even though you might say there's no downside to making predictions about the future, uh, we should be very careful in doing so. We ignore political, security, social, cultural, human rights changes 
in the region at our own peril. The rise of Iranian and Islamist violence, so many other incidents have shown that no matter where we are, including in Denver, Colorado, where I'm recording this lecture, events in the Middle East <clears throat> have impact on our lives and on, and on the security of Americans. Overuse of American power may have backfired in the recent past, but the investment of a small but focused American State Department presence and American defense resources in strong infrastructure in American and allied support for long-term interests has proven to my mind to have a great advantage. I think that the notion that the United States should be isolationists and get out of the Middle East, get out of influencing events in that region is one that in its sim most simplistic approach is dead wrong. We need to have good uh, diplomatic and good military support at, at appropriate levels uh, in the region. I gave this lecture the day before Veteran day, Veterans Day and I ended by saying the following. Thank you, veterans, for your service to our country. And thank you, viewers, for sticking uh, with my lecture. I hope you have found it useful. Thank you very much.